Martin. I'm Bob yes. Fennell. I'm mm -hmm. chair of the mathematics department at uh, Clemson University. I've admired your books and articles for many years. And on behalf of the Joint Policy Board for Mathematics, it's my sincere pleasure to be here to present this uh, communications award. This award is to uh, Martin Gardner uh, for his books and articles in the mathematics, the area of mathematics and clear communication ideas. Uh, we have a certificate and a check for $1,000 to mm -hmm. present to you. Uh, the certificate, if I may, reads communication award to Martin Gardner in recognition for exceptional creativity and sustained contributions in communi communicating mathematics in numerous books and articles and the mathematical games section of the Scientific American. Uh, I'll present this to you and congratulate you. Well, thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. I got into uh, writing about mathematics quite by accident. Uh, I did an article for Scientific American on hexaflexagons. That was in 1957. And um, I had heard about hexaflexagons from uh, friends of mine in the magic community. They were playing around with these strange objects. And, and uh, as you know, Feynman was one of the, the great Feynman was one of the co-discoverers, co-inventors of hexaflexagons. So it made an interesting story. And uh, uh, Jerry Peel, who was at that time the publisher of Scientific American, called me into his office after they had bought this article and asked me if there was enough similar material like this around to make a column. And I said, I thought there were. And so I rushed around New York, the old bookstores, and bought as many books on mathematics as I could, especially in, in the recreational field. And so the next month, uh, the column started under the title Mathematical Games. So that's how it began. I have to thank Jerry Peel for that. But up until then, I had never written anything about mathematics. Your career of communicating mathematics to the public. Uh, really, very few individuals, if anybody, have communed so much. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I've said before, and I, I'll say it again, that uh, if you write about mathematics for for the public, uh, popular writing on mathematics, it's good not to know too much about mathematics, and I think that's one of the secrets of the kind of writing that I do, and that is that I know mathematics only up to a certain level, and beyond that, it's very difficult for me to understand. So it's, I have to work so hard to understand anything that I'm writing about that it makes it easier for me to explain it, perhaps, in a way that the general public can understand, but I am not a mathematician in any creative sense of the word. I just, I love mathematics and I enjoy writing about it, but uh, I, I don't like to pose as a, as a genuine mathematician, more a journalist of mathematics. Yes, I started to subscribe to, uh, to the journals that I thought placed the strongest emphasis on recreational problems. Um, American Mathematical Monthly, a Mathematics Magazine, and Mathematical Gazette in England, for example, and a little publication in England called Eureka, published by the Archimedians quarterly. And uh, so this, this provided uh, new sources for material. And once the column got started, the material accumulated faster than I could get it into print, as a matter of fact. <laughs> But most mathematicians uh, find it very hard to write for the general public because they just uh, they're, they're, they're on such a high level that they can't bring it down to the point where anyone can under where the non-mathematician can understand it. Uh, I can't imagine Paul Erdős, for example, writing a popular article on number theory. <laughs> Lewis Carroll was a, a recreational mathematician. He published a 
several books on, on puzzles that he invented. Pillow Problems was the title of one of his books. And the two Alice books are loaded with uh, uh, recreational mathematics and linguistic play of all sorts and logical paradoxes and so on. And so uh, it occurred to me that no one had ever pulled this all together in uh, the form of footnotes for uh, an edition of Alice. Uh, and so that was, um, that, that was my most successful book in terms of sales. And uh, I followed it last year with a sequel called More Annotated Alice that contained, that doesn't overlap any of the notes in the first book. So there are two volumes now, uh, annotations of the Alice books. I've always th thought that the best way to uh, get students interested in mathematics is to give them uh, something that has a recreational flavor, a puzzle or a magic trick or a paradox or something like that. I think that hooks their interest faster than anything else. Uh, I recall uh, when I was taking geometry uh, in high school in Tulsa, uh, I had finished doing the work and I was p playing around with uh, trying to figure out how to win a game of tic-tac-toe. And I was playing around with a pencil and a sheet of paper and the geometry teacher came around and saw what I was doing and she snatched the paper away and said, when you're in my class I want you to work on mathematics and nothing else. And uh, that's al always amused me because I think uh, teaching children uh, aspects of tic-tac-toe is a wonderful way to introduce them to combinatorial geometry and number theory and uh, all ki and game theory. So it lead just that simple little game leads into uh, very significant areas of mathematics. So I think getting a child hooked on a puzzle or, or, or a mathematical magic trick or, or a game or a paradox I think that's the best way to teach mathematics on the lower levels. Well, I, as a matter of fact, um, I, I, maybe I should show you the severed hand. Shall I go get that? All right, let me, can I get up and go? Yeah, let me. Yeah, this is something sold in the magic stores now, but it's quite a startling illusion. And it's alive. <laughs> now I, I, I'll, I'll expose it. <laughs> yeah, but he does do good sleight of hand. Yeah, but I don't want to do that. But isn't that a funny idea? It's. Uh, you know, there's an old stunt schoolboys do. They stick the middle finger through a hole in the bottom of a matchbox, and you open the matchbox, and you've got this dead finger inside. And this is just an elaboration of that. <laughs> so you, uh, you mentioned to us an illusion. With oh, yeah. This is uh, something magicians uh, uh, use as a bet when they're in a bar. This is uh, called a zombie glass. And if you're ever served anything in a zombie glass, you can uh, always make this uh, peculiar bet. You bet that the circumference, the distance around the circumference, is greater than the height of the glass. And uh, it, looks, uh, it looks as though that's an impossibility. But if you measure it with a string or a strip of paper, the, uh, the circumference is a full half inch uh, longer than, I mean, than the height of the glass. But I have a lot of science or, toys, or for example, that, have you ever seen one of these? No. Oh, well, let, let me put it down. No, it's you turn it upside down. And, well, we'll have to wait a little while. And when the sand is almost completely through, it rises. And the question is, why? And uh, very few physicists uh, are able to figure it out. Usually, usually their wives figure it out first. Well, I, I, I don't think it's too important for the average person unless he has to make change, for example, and learn, learn a little bit about number theory. But, uh, but it's certainly important if you go into any of the sciences.
but I think uh, ordinary people can get along very well without knowing too much about mathematics, just as they can get along without knowing Latin. <laughs> so one of my main interests is in the philosophy of science. And um, after Carnap left the University of Chicago, he went out to California, and I persuaded him to tape record uh, his seminar, the one that I had taken, and his wife uh, typed it up and would send it to me uh, in chapter by chapter, and I edited that into a, a book called the, uh, the original title was called Philosophical Foundations of Physics, and now it's available under the title of Introduction to the Philosophy of Science, and I, I'm very proud of that book, although I, I had nothing to do with it except just to edit the Carnap material. But there's a sense, and I, when Ron, Ron Graham asked this question, I know what Ron was getting at, because I've heard Ron say that, that mathematics is not only real, but it is the only reality. And what he means by that is the following. Uh, that is that the entire universe is made of matter, obviously. And matter is made of particles. Uh, it's, it's made of... Uh, uh, electrons and neutrons and protons. And so the entire universe is made of, uh, finally, out of particles. Now, what are the particles made out of? And they're not made out of anything. The, the only thing you can say about uh, the reality of an electron is to cite its mathematical properties. So there's a sense in which matter has completely dissolved. And uh, what is left are just, is just a mathematical structure. So there's a sense in which uh, the entire universe is made out of mathematics and out of nothing else. So uh, the, uh, this is what Ron means when he says mathematics is not only real, that is, it's out there the way the universe is, but it's the only reality that's out there. Because at the very bottom of things, you have a mathematical structure. And in, it, it's a structure that's independent of human minds, in my opinion. So in that sense, I agree with the, uh, the mathematicians who call themselves Platonists, because uh, the, this is the view that, uh, that the mathematical structure has a reality of its own, and, it, and it's independent of the human mind. Or to put it another way, um, if, if, if humans, if intelligent beings were suddenly to disappear from the universe, uh, the Andromeda galaxy would still have a spiral structure, whether anyone was observing it or not. And so that's the sense in which I, I agree with the Platonists. Or, or, to, or to put it in terms of number theory, uh, if uh, two dinosaurs met two other dinosaurs on a clearing, there would be four dinosaurs there, even though there were no humans around to observe this event or to count, and even though the dinosaurs didn't know how to count. So this is the sense in, uh, in which I think mathematics is independent of the human mind. 